He says, I am the one who is and I was. But as you get into the book and as you get into this text, it no longer says I am to come. Why? Because he's there. It's the coming. Chapter 11. He's no longer going to come. He has come. And so then you have 12 to 14, which is talking about the whole crux and summary of the whole thing. And then you have 15 to 22, which says, this is the end. This is what it's like in the end. So it's important to look at these details because you can see there's so much theology in them. And he says, I, John, your brother and fellow partaker in the tribulation and kingdom and perseverance which were in Jesus, was on the isle called, or the island called Patmos because of the word of God and because of the testimony of Jesus Christ. And pictured on the screen, you actually see an aerial view of, uh, of uh, Patmos. And John said, I'm a fellow partaker. And what we actually discover is that tradition holds it at least, that John was in Ephesus, it's about 40 minutes off the coast of Turkey uh, by boat. And he, he was there for a, a purpose and he, he was witnessing. And tradition says that they, they tried to kill him and boil him in oil. But he would not die. And so they banished him to the island. Now we don't know if that's true or not, but it, it seems like it, it, it's very likely. Well, Patmos has about 3,000 permanent citizens. Here's a map of it. It has, uh, it's eight miles long. Its width varies. The climate is moderate, even in winter. And fresh water is almost non-existent. Cisterns are used in the rainy season. Today, large uh, tankers supply Patmos with millions of gallons of water. So just as you see these big tankers, you know, that carry oil, they have big tankers that carry water to the Isle of Patmos, and they fill up the reservoirs, and they do that on a regular basis. And I know that because it's just been, uh, I guess it was uh, 1999 that uh, Barbara and I went to the Isle of Patmos, and uh, we were on a boat, and I took this picture. We're, we're, we've just left from Ephesus, and we're on the boat, and we're headed to the island of Patmos. There it is in the distance. There's a little bit more of a close-up, and we visited this island, and it was an awesome experience. Here's a picture of the island. Notice the streets are very narrow. Uh, some of the streets are a little bit larger, but cars, not so much. Almost everybody has a bicycle because it's an island. You don't have petroleum on the island unless it's imported. We took a picture of this church simply because it was like downtown and it's by this gorgeous tree and it was pretty and we liked it. Wished we could have gotten married there. It's just so cute. But if you want to go to where the traditional site where John lived, you walk up this hill and you get up to the hill, and that's the uh, you get up the hill, and that's the view you see, a magnificent view. And uh, here are the bells uh, at the top of a monastery that was built at the top of the hill. And uh, there it is. There you can see the entrance the, to the door. Uh, that that's the the monastery. It's built over a cave, and tradition has it that John lived in this cave. And you go in through the doors, and there's a big chandelier. That's the first thing you see uh, because it's been, become a place of worship. There's a close-up of it. And as you go into uh, this uh, cave, uh, you see that there are multiple rooms. And in the first big room, there, there are no uh, flash bulbs allowed, no videos allowed. You can take a picture if you don't use a flash. So this is a poor quality picture, but it's the only picture I could get. And they're actually celebrating a worship service there. And then you go from there uh, into another room, and you get into this other room, and here is the room where they believe John lived. 
And uh, I'm going to turn my back to you and just show you with the laser pointer here that this area is fenced off. And there's a rock right here that tradition has it was used as a pillow. And John slept there and he used that rock as a pillow. And it said that over here there's a natural shelf. And it said that when he wrote it, uh, the, the book of Revelation, that he would lay the scrolls on that shelf. So they believe that this is actually the cave where John was when he wrote the book of Revelation. Now notice this. He said, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and I heard behind me a, a, a loud voice like the sound of a trumpet saying, write in a book the things that you see and write it to the seven churches. Well, what day is the Lord's day? Well, there are different possibilities. The first possibility is that it's uh, the day of judgment, the day of the Lord, or the time of judgment. The second possibility is the day of the Lord, uh, the emperors were considered lords. Maybe it was the Lord's birthday, and uh, that was the day of the Lord, just like we celebrate uh, different holidays. Uh, everybody celebrated the holiday as the day of the Lord. Or it could have been Sunday, Justin Mar Martyr refers to uh, the day of the Lord. He lived between 100 and 165, and in his writings, he's talking about Sunday, and he calls it the day of the Lord. Or it could have been the Saturday. It could have been an actual Sabbath day, God's holy day that uh, the Bible talks about. And he says, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. I happen to think that he's not talking about a specific day of the week. I think he's talking about a, a period of judgment, a long period of time. It's the day of the Lord. It's the time of judgment is what I think he's talking about. But I could be wrong in that. I, I don't know. I can't believe I just admitted I could be wrong. But maybe, you know, strange things happen. It could, it could be. Uh, and he says, I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me. And having turned, I saw the lampstands, and in the middle of the lampstands, one like the Son of Man, clothed in a robe, reaching to the feet, and girded um, across his breast with a golden girdle. So he heard, and then he saw. And that's a key thing. We'll come back to that in, the, in, in future times when we're talking about Revelation. But he heard, and he saw. Very, very critical to understand that. Well, here he has the seven lampstands. He's dressed like a priest, and that gives us a description. His head and his hair were like the white wool, like snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze. And when it has become hot and it glows in a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of many waters. So here's the description of Christ. We've just read it. I'm going to go quickly through this. Uh, we'll come back to these in the future. But it gives a picture of Christ. And so the artist has, has said, it looks something like this. And in his right hand, he held seven stars. And out of his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword. And his face was like the sun, shining in strength. Verses 16 and 17. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as a dead man. And he laid his right hand on me, saying, do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. So there's a picture. This is the one that's on your bulletin today. Uh, a picture of Jesus Christ. And he's in he, among the seven lampstands. And he says, I'm the living one. I was dead. And behold, I'm alive forevermore. I have the keys of death and of Hades. Write, therefore, before the, be, uh, the things which you have seen and uh, the things which are and the things which shall uh, take place after these things. So he's saying that same thing about the things that are going to happen as, as himself is, was, and is to come. And he says, and, and here is an interpretation now, and he tells us how to interpret it. As for the mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. So there is a direct interpretation. The stars are angels of the seven churches. So some people believe that these are actual angels that are assigned to a church to watch over it. 